Shalom. I want to welcome you today to this beautiful sanctuary, the sanctuary of Baruch Hashem Messianic Synagogue. And I'm standing before the Ark of the Covenant, behind which are the Torah scrolls. Passover is the story of God's deliverance of the Jewish people from bondage and slavery thousands of years ago. But today, as we look more closely at this ancient festival of redemption, you're going to see that God, in delivering Israel from bondage and slavery in Egypt, wove into the very fabric of that story a picture of a far greater redemption of all the world from the Egypt of sin through our Passover lamb, who is Jesus the Messiah. So let's travel back in time together to that first Passover story, which we find in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 12. We'll be reading verses 5 through 8 and 11 through 15. Now, if you remember at this time, Israel was in bondage. We were in slavery in Egypt, and God had promised he was going to redeem us. And so he raised up Moses and sent him to the Pharaoh of Egypt to say, Pharaoh, let my people go. Now, Pharaoh wasn't exactly willing to listen to Moses, so God had to persuade Pharaoh to listen. And God can be very persuasive when he wants to be. He persuaded Pharaoh to listen to Moses by sending a series of plagues on the land of Egypt. You remember the story. There were 10 plagues in all. Now, the Jewish people living in a, that section of Egypt called Goshen were automatically exempt from the first nine of those 10 plagues. For example, the Bible tells us when darkness fell across the land of Egypt as a plague from the Lord, there was nevertheless light in Goshen where the Israelites were living. Or when God smote the cattle of the Egyptians with plague, the cattle of the Israelites were spared. Not so with the 10th plague, the worst plague, the death of the firstborn. In order that that plague should not fall upon the Jewish people, God commanded them to take a lamb one lamb for each family. And that's where we pick up the story, Exodus 12, beginning with verse five. The lambs that you choose must be animals without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or from the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Now verse 11. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, eat it in haste, it is the Lord's Passover. On that same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days you are to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses. For whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day through the seventh must be cut off from Israel. So that then is the historical institution of Passover. We know then that the Passover, the first Passover, was celebrated on the 10th night of the plague in the land of Egypt. But as we just read, God commanded the children of Israel to continue to celebrate the Passover as a lasting ordinance. And so throughout our history, as we celebrated Passover, there were various symbols and traditions added to the observance to remind us of that first Passover back in the land of Egypt. So that by the time Jesus and his disciples were celebrating the Passover, all but two of the items that you see on this table today were already incorporated into that Passover. Now, of course, the most significant Passover that Jesus and his disciples celebrated was that one in the upper room in Jerusalem. The Last Supper was a Passover. 
So then how much more significant does this festival come to be for us who are his followers in light of all that he said and did on that night he was betrayed? And of course, we're still celebrating Passover every year in Jewish homes all around the world. And there's a tremendous amount of preparation that goes into the celebration of Passover. You might recall from the gospel accounts, Jesus even sent Peter and John ahead of him into the city of Jerusalem saying, go prepare the Passover that we may eat. Now, this preparation involves many different things, but most significantly doing exactly what we read about in Exodus chapter 12. We were to cleanse our houses of all leaven, anything with yeast in it. Of course, today that means that all your Krispy Kreme donuts, all your wheat bread, it has to go. But because Passover occurs in the springtime, it has become a time for a general house cleaning. And in the very orthodox or traditional Jewish home, mom begins weeks in advance cleaning floor to ceiling. There's even a whole different set of dishes put out for use at Passover. But we have a problem. The problem is that although it is the mother who does the cleaning, only the father, according to the rabbis, can declare that the house is properly clean. You can see what kind of a problem we have. The rabbis knew the men would be hard pressed to get the job done right by themselves, and they also wanted to ensure peace and harmony in the home at Passover. So they got together and thought about this problem and came up with a solution, which in Hebrew is called bedikat chametz, or the searching out of the leaven. Here's how it works. Night before Passover, mom, having cleaned the house, will take a little bit that's left over, maybe crumbs from the toast they had for breakfast, something with yeast in it, and she hides it somewhere in the house. Dad, coming home that evening, will take a feather, a wooden spoon, and a napkin and go on an inspection to search out the leaven, looking high and low for those crumbs. Now, if his wife has been good enough to him, she's hid it in the same place she hid it last year and the year before that, so that when he finally finds the crumbs with a steady hand, he scrapes them into the spoon with the feather, wraps the whole thing up in the napkin, and then in Jewish communities to this very day, you can still see men marching off to the local synagogue where there's a bonfire burning in the courtyard. He takes this package, tosses it into the bonfire, recites a prayer, and so declares the house now properly cleaned. An ingenious way for the men to get out of the house cleaning, right, ladies? But you know something? The Apostle Paul actually makes a very specific analogy to this custom in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse 6. Paul says, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and of wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so we see from that passage that leaven is not simply something with yeast in it. In the Bible, leaven is a symbol of sin. And just as leaven is a symbol of sin, so the unleavened bread that we eat to Passover, this now becomes a symbol of purity and of righteousness before God. Well, ladies, you have your very own bit of ceremonial glory, which actually ushers in the celebration of Passover. And at this time, the woman of the house will take this book, which is called Haggadah. Haggadah is a Hebrew word. It means the story or the telling. And within this beautifully bound and beautifully illustrated book, you will find all of the ceremony, the prayers associated with, and the story of Passover. So mom will take the Haggadah and she will read a special prayer from it as she begins the Passover Seder. That beginning is called a brachut haner, the lighting of the festival candles. And I'm going to invite my daughter Sivan to come up and to light the candles for us at our Passover remembrance. Sivan? Baruch Atatanai, Eloheinu Melchalam, 
I shake each other and it's so tough. Got to be on your side, but not Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the Universe, who has set us apart by His commandments and commanded us to light the lights of Passover. Amen. Thank you, Sivan. I think it's appropriate that it is the woman rather than the man who lights the candles and so brings light to the festival table. Because in the same way, it was not through a man, but through a woman that the light of the world came into the world. As the prophet Isaiah declared, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of my people Israel. And at this time, our Passover celebration can begin. Now, normally, Passover is not celebrated in the synagogue, but rather in the home, around the family dinner table. And you can see that on each of the chairs that we will have at our dinner table, there is a pillow. And the reason for the pillow is simply this. In Exodus 12, God commanded that the first Passover be eaten standing up. We were to have our loins girded, our shoes on our feet, our staves in our hands, ready to take off at a moment's notice. And in ancient Near Eastern culture, free people were the only ones who could recline at the meal. Once we were slaves and we stood, but now we are free, and so we recline. And as a symbol of our freedom, we recline on pillows. Now, one other thing is that Passover can sometimes take anywhere from four to six hours. So having a pillow underneath you, not a bad idea. But don't worry, we'll go through it quite a bit quicker as we remember the Passover today. The whole family participates. Mom lights the candles and the father has a special role to play and that's why I'm wearing this unique garment. This is a kittle which is a white linen robe with embroidery, symbolic of the same garment worn by the priests as they would minister in the temple on behalf of the nation of Israel, because of course the father is the priest of his family. And then there's this, the mitre, which symbolizes a crown from the ancient Near East. Of course, dad's also king of his castle, and appropriately attired, he leads his family in worship. The children are invited to participate in Passover in a number of different ways, but most significantly through the chanting of the Ma Nishtana, the four questions usually asked by the youngest child. These four questions serve as the basis for the Magid, the retelling of the story of the Passover. And here's what the first question sounds like. Ma Nishtana Halayla Hazeh Mikol Halelohod which means, why is this night different from all other nights? On all other nights, we eat leavened or unleavened bread. Why on this night do we eat only unleavened bread? And after reciting all four questions, the father then responds and retells the story of Passover. And this is a fulfillment of a command that God gave to Israel that we were to explain, to share, to retell the story of Passover, door by door, from generation to generation. And just as there are four questions that unpack the story of Passover, so you can see right here in front of me, there are four cups, which actually serve as the outline of the Passover service itself. Now, each of us, as we sit at the table, has just one cup. But you see, we drink from that cup four different times. And each time we drink, there's a different name and a different symbolism given to the cup. The first time we drink, the cup is called Kiddush, which literally means sanctification, because with this cup, we sanctify all that is to follow in our Passover Seder, our Passover celebration. And there is a traditional Hebrew prayer that we say over this cup. Yeshua, Jesus himself, said that prayer in the upper room with his disciples. And then he said something directly related to that Hebrew prayer. Boruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Borei pori hagafen Amen 
Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And then Jesus said, It is with great desire that I have desired to eat this Passover with you. But I tell you truly, I will not partake of the fruit of the vine again until I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. Everything in Passover is now blessed, and everything has a particular order to it as well. Seder is the Hebrew word for order. Passover is referred to as a Seder meal, and this is a Seder plate. You see these different circles on the plate. They actually correspond to different food items that are right here, each of them having a different meaning for our Passover celebration. And so the first item that we have on the Seder plate is called carpus, which is the Hebrew word for greens, in this case, parsley. Now, the rabbis tell us that the greens represent life. And we take some salt water, which represents the tears of life, and we dip the greens into the salt water, reminding us that during our slavery in Egypt, our lives were immersed in tears. You see, a life without redemption is a life immersed in tears. But we also remember that God redeemed us with a mighty and outstretched arm. He brought us out of bondage through that salty Red Sea and into freedom. And so now by his mercy and grace, our lives have been drawn from the tears of slavery. And we can eat the greens together to remind us that we now partake of life redeemed from tears by the mercy and grace of Almighty God. The second item on the Seder plate, <sighs> horseradish. We call it Jewish Dristan, and it's guaranteed to unclog the sinus passages in the back of your head. Now, the horseradish, or maror, as it's called in Hebrew, is the very bitter herb that God commanded us to eat, as we just read in Exodus 12. It reminds us of the bitterness of slavery. And what we do is we take some of this unleavened bread, the matzah, and we break off a piece like so and get, oh, about a teaspoon of it or a tablespoon if you're more courageous. And then I'm not going to do it. <laughs> you know what happens when you eat this much horseradish? You begin to cry. You have very little choice in the matter. It's a battle between the horseradish and your sinuses, and the horseradish always wins. But you know something? Those tears we shed are a graphic reminder of the tears our forefathers shed during their slavery in Egypt. And so by this, we are invited in, in a very tactile way, to participate in this whole redemption story. Now, you remember when Jesus celebrated Passover in the upper room with his disciples, he had said to them, one of you is going to betray me. Well, the disciples got all upset. They said, Lord, is it I? Is it I? And Jesus said, he who dips in the sop with me this night, that one will betray me. You remember that? Well, this is the sop. And think about it. Every one of those disciples would have dipped with Jesus that night every one of them. So think about this. Which one of them didn't also betray him? Every one of them, including Peter, who said, oh, Lord, I'll never betray you. They all did. But then later in that upper room, Jesus himself takes the bread with this sop and handing it to Judas Iscariot, saying to him, what you must do, go and do quickly. And the Bible tells us that when Judas took the bread with the sop, Satan entered into him, and he went out into the night. Maror is bitterness and tears. The next item on the Seder plate is called Charoseth. Now, I'm not sure if you can say that with me. Try it. Charoseth. You have to get the in there. Uh, just don't look at your neighbor when you're saying it, all right? Now, charoseth is a sweet mixture. Chopped apples, nuts, honey, raisins, cinnamon. It's delicious, but it represents the mortar that we used to make bricks for Pharaoh during our slavery in Egypt. Kind of looks like mortar. And, and so you might ask the rabbi, well, now, wait a minute, rabbi. If charoseth represents mortar for bricks, which was bitterness and, and toil to our people, why is this so sweet? 
Ah, the rabbi will say, because you see, even the bitterest of our toils grew sweet when we knew that our redemption drew near. And once again, we take some of the unleavened bread, we break it off and get, oh, about a tablespoon of it on there. <laughs> and what we find is that as we eat this mixture, that bitter taste in our mouths that was left from the horseradish just disappears in the sweetness of the charoset, which is a very tactile reminder of how even the bitterest things that we must face in this world, how they can be sweetened by the hope and promise of God's redemption. The next item on the Seder plate is called Hazaret. Hazaret is a bitter root, a horseradish root, but if you don't have one of those, an onion will suffice because this rests on the Seder plate simply as a symbol, the bitter root of life. You see, during our slavery in Egypt, our lives were indeed bitter. The very root of our lives, slavery, was bitterness to us. But here's some good news. If anyone is in Messiah, the scriptures say what? He's a new creation. She's a new creation. The old things have passed away, new things have come. And that is good news indeed for all who want to be in Messiah. Now, the last two items on the Seder plate are actually the only two not present when Jesus celebrated in the upper room. And you'll understand why in just a moment. First of all, this one is called Chagiga. As you can see, it is a brown egg that has been hard-boiled. <laughs> but Chagig was actually also the name given to the temple sacrifice made at Passover. So this egg represents that sacrifice. Now we peel the egg and we slice it. But before we eat the slice, we dip it into the salt water, which represents, do you remember what? Tears, that's right. Because you see, we're mourning the fact that this represents a sacrifice that is no longer. A sacrifice that was centered in the temple, which is no longer standing. Titus and his Roman legions marched into the city of Jerusalem, destroying the city, destroying the temple, and from that day until this very present day, there has been no temple and there can be no sacrifice. And so because of that, we mourn its absence every year at Passover. And lastly, on the Seder plate, going together with Chagiga is this, which is called the Zroah, the shank bone of a lamb. You see, as much as there is no sacrifice because of this, many rabbis, though not all, will tell us we no longer should eat lamb at Passover. We have to have some other meat as a main course. And this Zroah, this shank bone, rests on the Seder plate like the Chagiga, like the egg, to remind us of that sacrifice made in the temple in Jerusalem so long ago. And we read about that sacrifice in Exodus chapter 12. God commanded they be yearling male lambs without spot, without blemish, without any broken bone, we were to take that lamb and sacrifice it. Now this reminds me of another perfect Passover lamb who contrary to Roman custom did not have his legs broken when he hung on the cross. And so did Jesus, the Messiah, fulfill messianic prophecy. We come now to the second cup, which is called the cup of plagues. We don't drink from this cup right away, but rather we dip our finger in the cup and drop a drop of the juice on the plate in front of us. One drop for each of the plagues God visited on the land of Egypt. We remember the blood, the hail, the locusts, the darkness, the death. Nine times Pharaoh hardened his heart and each time God sent a plague on the land of Egypt. But the tenth plague was the worst of all, the death of the firstborn. Now God told the children of Israel to take the blood of the sacrificed lamb in a basin, to go outside of their homes and apply that blood to the doorposts, putting it on the top lintel and the two side posts. 
the blood of the lamb on the top lintel and the two side posts. And some have remarked that this indeed makes the sign of a cross with the blood of the lamb on that doorpost. That night death flew through the land of Egypt. There was weeping and wailing as never before till Pharaoh cried out, let them go, let them go or I'll die. But everywhere that the blood of the lamb was on the top lintel and the two side posts, death passed over that house. And so redemption came that night to the children of Israel in the land of Egypt. Now because I believe in Jesus as my Messiah, and because I have by faith applied the blood of his sacrifice to the doorpost of my heart, when death comes to visit me, death is going to pass over me also because I have eternal life. Praise God for that. This is a matzah tash. Matzah, of course, is the unleavened bread, and tosh means bag or pouch, and that's what this is. It's a bag for unleavened bread. In fact, there are three pieces of unleavened bread inside the matzah tosh. And the rabbis tell us that the matzah tosh represents a unity. Three pieces of bread, one bag, three in one. And yet, there is a great deal of disagreement among the rabbis as to which unity it is this matzatash represents. Writing in the Haggadah, one rabbi tells us it represents the unity of the patriarchs, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Another rabbi writes, no, no, it represents the unity of worship in Israel, the high priest, the Levites, and the people of Israel. And on goes several more suggestions. Now, I believe the matzatash represents a unity also. But I believe that the matzatash represents the unity of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And here's why. During a particular time of the Passover, we will reach into the second compartment of the matzatash. Now you can ask the rabbi, Rabbi, why do we take the second piece and leave the first and third pieces alone? And the answer is, we don't know. <laughs> it's tradition. And we take out this second piece that was hidden. And there are three things I want you to notice about this matzah that make it acceptable for Passover. First of all, this is an entire loaf of bread. And look at it, it's flat like a cracker. And that's because this is unleavened. There's no yeast in it whatsoever. And in fact, we're so concerned that there be no rising in the bread that we take a device and we poke holes in the bread. So this bread is also pierced. And then we bake it on a hot oven rack and these brown stripes are often baked right onto the bread. So that's what matzah is. It's unleavened, it's striped, and it's pierced. Even as our sinless Messiah was striped by the Roman whips, pierced by the nails in his hands and feet and the spear in his side, as predicted some 700 years beforehand, through the prophet Isaiah, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was pierced for our diseases, and by his stripes we are healed. So now we take this second piece, the middle portion of the matzotash, and we break it in half. Taking this broken piece now, we wrap it in a linen cloth or in a linen bag. And this second piece, broken, wrapped in a linen cloth, is called the afikomen, a word meaning it comes later. And what we do with this second piece is we now carry it outside of the room of celebration to be hid for a time, buried, if you will. And this is such an important part of the Passover that the entire celebration cannot be completed without that second piece. And we'll get back to that in just a minute. This last part of the Passover is the most important for us as followers of Messiah to understand. Towards the end of the meal, the head of the house will say to all the children, go search for the afikomen. That is that second piece that was broken, wrapped in a linen cloth and hid for a time. Now, this is a great time of fun for the kids because they did not see where it was hidden. And so they, at this point, get to scurry around the house looking for that second piece, because you see the child who finds it brings it back to the head of the house and receives a reward. When I was growing up, that reward was a dollar. 
I think with inflation, it may be five or $10, whatever the case may be. Having rewarded the child, the father then stands and continues this ancient ceremony of the matzotash and the afikoman by breaking off small pieces and distributing to everyone seated at the meal. Everyone now receives a piece of this bread. Does this remind you of anything? You see, it was at this time that Jesus himself distributed the bread. You see, my friends, if the matzotash represents the unity of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, why is that middle piece broken, buried, and brought back? If the matzotash represents the unity of worship, the priests, the Levites, and the people, why is that second piece broken, buried, and brought back? But if the matzotash represents the unity of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then we know why. It's because Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, was broken in death, wrapped in a linen cloth, buried in the tomb, and then brought back, resurrected by the power of God, conquering sin, conquering death, so that it is no wonder that Jesus took this bread and broke it and gave to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do you see the picture? And what a picture it is. And then he took the cup. Well, now you know we take the cup four times during Passover. So which time was it? Well, we have the first two cups. And then comes the meal of the Passover. And the cup that comes directly after the meal is the third cup. And that's what the Apostle Paul tells us, that Jesus took the cup after they had supped. And the third cup is none other than the cup of redemption. Redemption. Looking back to the redemption God brought our forefathers and looking forward to that redemption in Moshiach Kuman, when the Messiah comes. And Jesus, having taken the bread, now after supper takes the cup and raises it up and says to his disciples and to all of us today, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. New covenant covenant. Those words would have echoed in the minds of the Jewish people, the disciples who were there in that upper room. For only one place in all of the Hebrew Bible is Brit Chadashah, New Covenant mentioned. And that is in the book of Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning with verse 31. Jeremiah says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make Brit Hadashah, a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they break, although I was a husband to them, saith the Lord. You see, that was the problem with that first covenant. It became a broken covenant. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts, and on their hearts will I write it. First covenant was written on tablets of stone. The new covenant was to be written on the tablet of our hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their sin and remember their iniquity no more. Oh, this was the ultimate condition upon which that new covenant rested. For no longer would sin be atoned for through daily offerings of animals in the temple, but once and for all would God deal with this most difficult of human predicaments. And now we find Jesus coming to the very climax of the Passover in that upper room, taking the bread, taking the cup, and saying to us, that which you've been waiting for, that which has been promised, that new covenant has now come in my blood. Imagine how the disciples must have felt after having celebrated this Passover year after year after year, and then one day in that upper room in Jerusalem, seeing its very fulfillment. To imagine that God, in delivering Israel from bondage and slavery in Egypt, did indeed weave into the very fabric of this story the picture of the greatest redemption of all. 
And of that redemption, you and I partake now if we know Christ as our Savior, if we have applied the blood of his sacrifice to the doorpost of our hearts. Yes, Jesus is our Passover lamb. Hallelujah. We've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb. And the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. What other way is fitting for the redeemed to respond than to say so in great thanks and praise to God for what he has accomplished on our behalf. And that is exactly how Passover comes to a conclusion. We have a big say-so celebration singing together from the Jewish national hymnal. You should all have copies the Psalms. <laughs> the Psalms were Israel's hymnal and Psalms 113 through 118 called the Hallel Psalms are sung at this time. And imagine, if you will, Jesus and his disciples singing these songs and especially the climax of the singing in Great Hallel, Psalm 118, which declares the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and this is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Save now, we beseech thee. Save now, O Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so, having sung that song, we take the fourth cup, which goes together with the hymns of praise. This is Hallel, the cup of praise. And all over the world, as we take the fourth cup and raise it up, singing praises to God, drinking to remember his deliverance, Jewish people will conclude the Passover saying, Lashana Haba Berushalayim next year in Jerusalem. You see, Passover not only looks back to the redemption that God brought us from Egypt, but it looks forward to that redemption that we still await, that will culminate in the holy city of Jerusalem. And therein lies the burden of my heart and that of Jews for Jesus. For so many of my Jewish people have not seen what you've just seen. And celebrating the Passover do not understand the significance of the lamb, of the bread, of the cup. Oh, it's not that we're not waiting for Messiah. We are waiting for him. In fact, there is a tradition within the Passover that perhaps, just perhaps, Elijah the prophet will come at our Passover Seder. He's the forerunner of the Messiah, the one who is to tell us Messiah is on his way. And so at each Jewish Passover table, there is a separate cup from the four. This is Elijah's cup. And it is filled and set off by itself. No one drinks from the cup. But at a particular time, the head of the house will say to the youngest child, go and open the door for Elijah. And as the door is open, we all rise to greet him and say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then together we sing what is the oldest Hebrew melody known today. Eliyahu ha-navi, Eliyahu ha-chishbi, Eliyahu, Eliyahu, Eliyahu Hagiladi. Elijah the prophet, Elijah the Tishbite, Elijah the Gileadite, come even in our days and bring with you Messiah, son of David. And every year my people stand, and every year my people sing, and every year we wonder, is he ever going to come? You see, they don't know of that one named Yochanan. You may know him as John, John the baptizer, who coming in the spirit of Elijah, one day saw a Jewish man coming up over the hill and declared, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Of him, Jesus said, if you care to receive it, this one is Elijah. They don't know. And they don't know of that one named Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, who is that lamb who's taken away the sin of the world. And maybe you've been watching here today and you haven't known 
until now, that he is indeed that lamb, Jesus, the Passover lamb, and that by trusting him, you too can have your sin forgiven. The evidence is before you. Right now, you can receive him too. Just pray simply, Jesus, I believe you are Messiah. Come and forgive me of my sin and make me a child of God. And he will hear you and he will answer your prayer and he will make you one of his own. You know, the scriptures point us both backwards and forwards. And we can see that here in the Passover. Henceforward, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show forth the Lord's death until he come again. And we say together, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen.